IIS bindings is the topic of today's lesson. Good day. My name is Scott Forsythe. This is week five of a 52-week series on various technical topics for IT web administrators. This is the first of many regarding IIS. IIS stands for Internet Information Services. It's Microsoft's web server platform for hosting websites. So the topic of IIS bindings is an important one. It's pretty straightforward for the most part, but it's foundational and I hope I cover a lot that's beneficial to people, uh, whether you're just starting out or maybe fill in some gaps to others as well. First, what is a binding? Every request that arrives at an IIS web server carries some type of information that uniquely identifies it. Uh, for example, the port, the IP address, and the domain name, potentially. And so this web server needs to know which site is it going to serve up, depending on what was entered. And obviously wouldn't do to serve up a random site each time. So that's where the IIS web bindings come in. And so today I want to talk more about the HTTP bindings. Next week I'm going to dig in more and show the network packets and understand a little bit more about the HTTPS and SSL and host headers, which is a fun topic in itself. So there's four and only four bindings that IIS uses to make a decision. So if we go to a website here, let's say Contoso, and I go to the binding and hit add, this will give us an example really of the four decision points that IIS makes. So the first is the type or the protocol, the second is the IP address, the third is the port, and the fourth is the host name. Not necessarily in that order, but those are the four of them. The type for the most part is going to be HTTP or HTTPS or potentially FTP if you're setting up FTP server and also WCF, Windows Communication Foundation, has some as well that you'll see here uh, potentially as long as it's installed. So that needs to be selected. In this case, we're going to be testing HTTP today. The IP address, in this case, it's all unassigned. It can be left as all unassigned, which is basically a wildcard, or you can specify the IPs on the server. Now, for the most part, this drop-down will give you a choice of all the IPs on your server, but it doesn't always, especially if you have a lot of IPs or certain situations where it doesn't, and that's not a problem. You can actually freeform type in your IP if you need to. The next decision point is the port, and this, besides the type, is the only one that must be specific. You can't leave a wildcard with IIS. And so I would recommend, highly recommend as much as possible, leave these to the default of 80 for HTTP and 443 for HTTPS. And the reason is the web browser assumes that, and then people don't have to type it explicitly. We'll cover this a little bit more shortly. Um, the fourth decision point is your host name. Again, it can be left blank. If it's left blank, it's a wildcard, and will catch everything for any host header as long as the other bindings match. Or you can type in something very specific, so contoso.com. And the bindings haven't changed really from IIS6. The concept was the same. So here's a screenshot I just grabbed from an IIS6 machine. And notice that you have the exact same thing. Your IP address, your port, your host header, and then the protocol is determined by, in here, it's HTTP, here is HTTPS, and FTP is supported in another section of IIS. So really the concept has remained the same. It carries both ways. If you're familiar with it in IIS 6, there's no changes, and vice versa. So with most of the theory aside, let's actually dive in and take a look at some of the examples here. Uh, first, it is important to understand that it must be unique. If you can't have two identical bindings on the server, otherwise IIS doesn't know which site to serve up. So let's actually test that real briefly. What happens if you have duplicates, and how does IIS handle it? So if we go here to www.acme.com, if it's on the exact same site, it says a binding with this IP address, port, or host name combination already exists. It must be unique. So it will not let you even apply it. So thanks, IIS. That's wise of you. So let's actually try this from a second site, and this time, acme.com, it gives us a warning that says this binding is already assigned to another site. If you assign the same binding to this site, you'll only be able to start one of the sites at a time. Do you want to continue? So let's say, yes, we want to continue. If I hit the sites and refresh, notice, actually you can't tell because of the double bindings here, but our Contoso is stopped right now and we didn't want that at all. So I try to start it, it says we can't. We have two du duplicates. So we have two sites with the exact same binding. And this is a big deal. Uh, for one, we just killed the site. We broke it. And two, on a server rebuild, 
reboot, I should say, if we try this with the exact same configuration that we have right here, there's going to be a race condition. And one or the other site could start. We don't know which one. And it could give you really undesired effects. So don't leave duplicate bindings floating around your system, um, especially if you have both of them trying to start. So let's go and fix this. Let's remove this one here. Okay, so what we want to do for the sake of testing, first a DNS request must come in to your server. And so you would generally set that up with your DNS server. For the sake of the testing here today, I'm going to use the host file. And you may be familiar with it. If you're not, it's located in C Windows, System32, Drivers, etc., or ETC. And there's a file called Hosts with no extension. So we can open this in Notepad. And this is configured. Uh, you can see that the pound is a comment. So we can start entering here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 127001, our loopback adapter, basically an IP that's already assigned to this machine. And we're going to say www.acme.com. Now also we have to be very specific about this, is we need to make sure that we have both acme.com and www.acme.com. So we'll enter both here. Also, if I go to, and I do an IP config, the IP address of my local machine is right here. Let's use this for contosa.com. and www.contosa.com. So we're actually going to come in as two different IP addresses that are both legitimate on this server. Um, in your case, your network administrator, whether that's you or someone else, or your web host, may be able to provide you with multiple IP addresses. And we'll talk about why you may or may not need multiple IP addresses. So if we save this, this is immediately available on the local machine. So let's try acme.com. And notice if I ping it, I get 127.0.0.1 where you're not going to get that address if you ping it from your computer. Obviously, the host file is only seen from this local computer. Uh, so host file is great for testing, and make sure to clean up behind yourself, or you're going to have some undesirable effects if you forget that you have certain bindings that are meant to be used for something else. Okay, so now if we take this, and let's go to... Uh, let's go to www.acme.com and notice this is welcome to Acme. That's the test site that I set up. And also, remember I had mentioned about putting the port in. If I type in port 80 like this, it's assumed, so it's not necessary, but I can put in port 80. Let's now change this binding and see what happens when we change. Let's use our www.acme.com and we change this to port 80, let's say 82. So we save this and go to set this to 82 and notice that it works. So you have to be explicit about it and for the most part you don't need to use custom ports but you may want to use it for testing URLs, uh, for web servers is very common that you may do it for, or administrative sites sometimes just use for internal staff. You don't mind, you'll see people using 8080 and ports like that sometimes for, particularly for testing. Okay, you may wonder, when do you use a dedicated IP or when would you use a shared IP in the bindings here? So the decision comes down to a couple. One, if you have the IPs available for you, go for it. It's usually better and easier to manage a static IP for every single site. It may become essential for HTTPS, and I'll cover this more in depth next week. So if you have a number of different certificates and you need to have them uniquely bound, then you want to use a dedicated IP address because the host header becomes a little bit tricky. Notice it's great out here. I'll cover this in more depth next week. Uh, years and years ago, there was a difference between host headers. Not all search engines followed host headers and honored them the same way, but that really is not a case nowadays. So using host headers and a single IP address can work as long as you don't have a certificate. And so it really depends on you whether you can get those IPs or not. It's also easier to manage, usually, if it's at a wildcard. So, for example, um, acme.com, notice that I had set this up to 127001. So let's go in here, and let's make this more specific on the IP, and less specific on the host name. So I'm going to say 127001 is always going to be acme.com, and let's go to Contoso, and let's say here that our IP of... 10.245.22 with a wildcard host header is being used. So now, if I go to acme.com 
Notice it correctly resolves to the right site. And if I use www.contosa.com, it correctly resolves to contosa.com. Notice that the domain name itself did not have to be entered in the binding. So check our bindings again, Contoso. Again, all I'm doing is assigning the static IP address and any domain name whatsoever can be used. Again, so the real difference here is you don't need to be specific about your host name if you have a dedicated IP address. And again, you can change any one of these as long as whatever decision point you make is completely unique. Or I should clarify that that combination of unique decision points needs to be unique. Any individual thing can vary as long as the set as a whole is unique. Really, that's, that's it. Again, just a quick recap. Every binding has to be absolutely unique. The host header is completely optional. If you do use a host header, it cannot use any type of wildcard whatsoever. You have to enter an entry for every single one. So domain.com, you'd have to enter, and you'd have to enter one without the dub dub dub. One for every single one that you use. If you have .NET addresses, domain.net, for example, you would have to use as well. Actually, what I meant to do is create a new one there. So if we do domain.com and then a www.domain.net there. So now you can see every single one is set. In this case, if you're explicit in the host name, you don't have to be. And you can do all unassigned for the IP address, potentially, if you want. And then this will work whether on the loopback adapter or externally from another IP. Well, that sums it up. Hope you found this useful, and please keep tuning in. Next week we'll be talking about SSL bindings and a chicken before the egg and the issues that we run into with host headers and SSL bindings. Thank you. Hope you have a great week.